we're going to talk about uh, the gift of righteousness and no more consciousness of sin. Okay? I know I can see several of you are extremely excited about that. <laughs> but let's read the Bible and let's see what the Bible says to us about this. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 1, when you're there, say, I am. I am. It says, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. Now once again, I just dropped you into a passage of the Hebrew writer and if we're going to go together, we've got to set some context around this so we understand what's being talked about. The Hebrew writer here is, is, is throughout the book of Hebrews, he is comparing the old covenant under Moses to the new covenant that has been established in and through the finished work of Jesus of Nazareth. Are you still here? I said, are you still here? So there's an old covenant and there's a new covenant. The old covenant is established with Abraham and his seed. Galatians chapter 3 clarifies to us that when God says that the promise is to Abraham and his seed, that the promise that God made is to Abraham and to Christ. The Bible says, and to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. And it does not say seeds as of many, but to his seed as of one who is Christ. That's Galatians 3, 13 and following. So the promise, when God made the promise to Abraham, he was talking to Abraham and to Jesus. He was not talking to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was talking to Abraham and to Jesus. Are you still here? Uh, do I need to show you this? Okay. He was talking to Abraham. Read Galatians chapter 3, 13, 14, 15, 16. It's around like 16, 17, 18, right there. Okay, so, so, so when God makes this covenant with Abraham, the covenant God made with Abraham, stay with me, has no ordinances, no statutes, no commandments with it. It just has a principle and the foundational principle that God gives Abraham initially is the tithe and then he expands on the principle. But hear me, when God makes covenant with Abraham, there is no law. The covenant was made with Abraham by promise. God made a promise to Abraham, and the Bible says Abraham believed God. <laughs> and it was credited to him for righteousness. So because Abraham believed God's word, God credited Abraham with being righteous even though he wasn't. And he said, because you believe me, Abraham, I'm going to treat you like you're righteous. I need you to see this. Because, because Paul makes this argument in the book of Romans when he's arguing uh, arguing spiritually, I mean, I mean arguing in the Greek sense of the word, he's presenting a case, he's not angry, you understand? He is arguing that the promise that God made to Abraham, he made to Abraham without ordinances, without stipulations, without the law. The Bible says the law was added later because of transgressions. In other words, the law was added because a group of people came up who didn't believe God. See, Abraham believed God. So he didn't need any, any law. He didn't need any commandments. He didn't need any you shall nots. He didn't need, he didn't need any thou shalt not and thou shalt not. He didn't need it because he believed. 
But then the Bible says a group of people came up under Abraham's uh, lineage who didn't know the God Abraham knew and who didn't believe the words of that God. And so the Bible says, so God had to add the law because of transgression. Now this is very important. This is why the covenant is not called the Mosaic covenant. The one we're in. It's not with Moses. Because Moses was the lawgiver. Our covenant is with Abraham and with Jesus. Galatians 3. And if you are Christ's, then are you Abraham's, not Moses' seed. Are you still here? Now I'm giving you a little background because what the Hebrew writer is telling us is that when, when God added the law to the promise he made to Abraham. He says, the law had a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things. He says, because uh, he said, the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. Here was the problem. God made a covenant with Abraham and there was no law. Right. Yeah. Right. Abraham believed God. Right. God credited Abraham with righteousness and just blessed him because he believed. Right. Yeah. Right. Then a group of people came up who didn't believe the same way Abraham believed. So the law had to be added because of transgression. And then once God gave the law to the people, the people began to think that by keeping the law, they would become acceptable to God. Right. When God was like, wait a minute, time out. The law didn't even start this. This was started by a promise. Right, right, right. Strong. Not by a commandment. That's strong. Yes. And so there developed a whole system of religion and do's and don'ts. And a group of people came to, into being who then began to think they were superior to everybody else because they kept the commandments. And God's like, wait a minute, time out. The commandments weren't the point. Believing me was the point. Come on, say amen to this. And so the Hebrew writer now is making the case that all the commandments and the sacrifices that were given were a shadow of things to come and not the thing itself. Now I've said this to you many, many times. The, the shadow of a thing, when you have the shadow of a thing, you do not have the thing. The shadow only tells you that there is a thing. But the shadow is not the thing. Are you still here? So the Bible is telling us the law contained a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things. And it's telling us here, that the law could never with those sacrifices they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. Now watch this. Watch the genius of the Holy Spirit as he pins this through the Hebrew writer. Once again, I say the Hebrew writer because theologians don't know who the book of Hebrews is really accredited to. Some say it's Paul. Some say it's the other. I believe it's Paul because of the consistency of the level of revelation. However, because I know I'm being critiqued by theologians who are watching, I always say the Hebrew writer. Just so they know I'm edumacated. Watch. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, can never with these same sacrifices with the offer year by year make those who approach perfect or make those who approach complete. Now what's he talking about? He's talking about the sacrifice that was given on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, once a year, when the high priest came into the Holy of Holies and made atonement. Atonement. At one meant. See, the purpose was oneness between God and his people. So when the high priest came in once a year with the blood of bulls and goats on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and made sacrifice for the sins of the nation. 
once that sacrifice was accepted, there was at one minute, there was union between God and his people for another year. The people who were making the sacrifices, that was the Jewish nation, began to think or believe that their sacrifice is what made them acceptable to God. But God was reminding them, wait a minute, Abraham was accepted by me without blood. Without sacrifices. Come on, say amen to this. I'm going somewhere with this. Now, no, now notice the genius of the reason. I'm taking a moment with this on night one because we're going we're gonna to go deep night two and we're going to need scuba gear on night three. So, so, I'm, so I'm just, I'm just so watch this. So it says, can never with those same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect or make those who approach complete. Now look at the reasoning. Look at the genius of the Holy Spirit here. He says, for then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worshipers once purified or once purged would have had no more consciousness of sin. Now here's what he's saying. He's saying this. Yeah. He's saying if any one of those sacrifices, if any one of the bulls or goats that were offered on the Day of Atonement could have dealt with the sin issue completely, if any one of the peace offerings, the sin offerings, the heave offerings, the wave offerings of the law, if any one of those offerings could have dealt with the sin issue and made God and his creation one again in truth, if any one of those would have completely worked, here's what would have happened. The moment it worked, the worshipers or the ones bringing the offering would have had a witness, this matter is settled, we don't have to do this next year. <laughs> In other words, he, ah, he said, if any one of those sacrifices had settled the plan with God, then they would have ceased to have been offered because the worshipers, oh God, help the people here. Once they knew the matter was settled, would have had no more need to bring an offering because they would have no more consciousness of sin. Now what is the Hebrew writer speaking to? He is speaking to this fact that once this matter is settled for good, there should be something that happens on the inside of the worshiper that changes their conscience and their disposition. Now this is what has not happened to the church. And it has not happened to the church because we have constantly preached the wrong message to new creation. I want you to get what the Bible is saying. The Bible is saying that there is supposed to come a point in the worshiper where they have no more consciousness of sin. Touch three people and say, are you there yet? No more consciousness of sin. No more consciousness of sins being no more need to bring a sacrifice. No more need to make a deal with God. No more need to say I'm unworthy. No more need to say I'll never do it again. He said the worshiper is supposed to get to the place where there's no more, they, they, there's, there's no more need in them to come to God and make a deal with God. And most of the church is not there. Can we read on? Can, can we read on? Watch this. He says, for, for, he, says, he says, for then would they have not ceased to be offered. For the worshipers once purified would have no more causes of sin. Watch this now. He says, but in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is not possible that the blood of, gold, of, of bulls and goats should take away sins. Now what is he saying? He's saying every time they brought a sacrifice, 
they were being reminded that the matter isn't settled. Every time they brought another bull, every time they brought another goat, every time they had another Yom Kippur, they were, they were being reminded, ah, we're sinners and we got to, the matter's not settled. Now, oh God, I'm, I'm going to get ahead of myself. And see, what, 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 what we don't understand is every time we make a deal with God, every time we try to plead with God, what we're doing is we're testifying to the fact that we don't believe the matter is settled. Which is why we pray prayers like, God, if you just, if you just, if you just bless me one more time, like God is capable of just blessing you one more time. He's a blesser. He can't stop. That's what he does. He can't bless you just one more time. If you hang out with him, he's going to bless you again and again and again because it's his nature to bless. Touch your neighbor and say, he's good. He's good all the time. So, so, so watch this. She says, we're in those sacrifices. There was a reminder of sins. Oh, Jesus, help the people hear this. Every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Watch this. Therefore, when he, that is Jesus of Nazareth, came into the world, he said, well, actually, when he, that is the word, <laughs> came into the world, he said. Now, this is the Hebrew writer telling us the conversation that happened between the word and the father before the incarnation. The incarnation is when the word becomes flesh. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus was not in the beginning. The word was in the beginning. When a flesh and blood body is given to the word. He's named Jesus. The Holy Spirit shall come upon you and the power of the highest shall overshadow you, the angel told Mary, Luke 135, and that holy thing that shall be born unto you shall be called the Son of God and you shall call his name Jesus. Because his name wasn't Jesus before the incarnation. Before the incarnation, he is the word. Are we still here? Now, I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to wow you. I'm trying to show you what your Bible teaches. Are we still here? Was well, therefore, when he that is the word came into the world, he that is the word said, sacrifice it all. So now the word is talking to the father. <laughs> sacrifice an offering you did not desire. The word is telling the father, I get it, dad. You were not after sacrifices and offerings. You created this system, but that was not your point. Now you've got a whole group of people who have majored in a system and have no understanding of you. Now this happened in the Jewish tradition it has also happened in the church tradition. There's a whole group of people who understand the religion we preached, but they don't have an understanding of the God that they say they serve. But touch your neighbor and say, that's not going to be us. We're going to understand. We're going to get a revelation. Watch this. He says, therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. Watch, but a body. You have prepared for me. I can't help it. I want you to see the beauty of it. He's looking at the body. And he said, you prepare me a body. <laughs> watch, watch, watch. Sacrifice and burnt offering. You did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, Father, you had no pleasure. That never pleased you. Not one dead goat, not one dead bull, not one dead ram, not one peace offering, not one sin offering, not, not one of those things pleased you. You set up this system so temporarily 
people could have relationship with you, but that was not what you were after. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, now the word is talking. Then I said, woo! Then I said, behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it's written to me. In other words, he said, I'm coming now, Dad. They've been talking about me for years. They've been prophesying about me for years. They've been saying I'm coming for years. I'm coming now, watch this, to do your will. Oh, God. Now, I want you to get it, because this is the Word talking. So if the Word says you didn't want this, but I have come to do your will, then that was not his will. It was a part of his plan, but it was never his will. Oh, that the church... Oh, that people would understand that God will allow things in his plan that are not necessarily his will. I don't have time to go into that. Don't even have time. Don't even have time. Don't have time. That's another night right there. If I go down there, I got to add Saturday. Probably morning and evening in order... Are y'all okay? Okay. All right, watch this. Uh, uh, then I said, behold, verse 7, I have come to do your will. In the volume of the book is written me, I've come to do your will, O God. Now watch this. Look at verse 8. Oh, listen. Listen, watch again. The genius of the Holy Ghost as he points it out. So, so he says, previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burn offerings and offerings for sins you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first yes. that he may establish the second. So watch what the Holy Spirit said. He said in saying that, something is happening. He is taking away the first. Now what is the first? Now, let, me, let me read it again. Previously saying, sacrifice and offerings, burnt offerings and offerings of sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first. Now what is the first? The first is sacrifice. He takes away sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings for sin. He takes away offerings for sin. Now, no offering that any new creation brings is to be for sin. It's only to be for something good. It's only to receive something that has already been finished. It's not to get anything done. No offering of the new creation is to get something done. It's only to express belief in a done thing. Are you still here? See, the new creation is never making down payments on anything. The new creation is always thanking God for a thing already paid for. Praising God for a thing already done. Every offering I bring is a celebration of something already finished that hasn't manifested yet, but it's on its way. Can you see the difference that that makes in a worshiper? When you get to the point, that, uh, Pastor Ricks, where there's no consciousness of sin, I'm not dealing with sin at all. I'm dealing with the goodness of God. Let me stay. Let me stay. Let me. Now we're going to get... Wait, wait, wait. Wait, Bishop, but Bishop, I hear you, but what a bad sin. You see how preoccupied we are? Because of what we have been preached. And again, I'm not faulting the preachers. Listen, we've all preached what we were taught to preach. By listening to other people preach. Oh, Jesus. 
preacher, pray for me. Just pray for me. But, but, but one of the, one of the, one of, one of the most significant things you can do if you want to preach new creation truth and walk in new creation truth is be more selective about who you let preach to you. Because when you start moving in this, there are people you like. There are people I like I can't listen to. Like them, like the, like the church, like the way, like their TV program, can't listen to you. I just turn you on mute and look at the pictures. Beautiful. Still here? Okay, watch this. Watch this. Ah, Lord, help me. Okay. So, so he takes away the first, verse 9. Now, I can't, I, can't, I got to go back. Okay. Verse 8. Previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first. He takes away sacrifices, offerings, and burnt offerings for sin. And he establishes the second, I have come to do your will of God. So he takes away sacrifices, burnt offerings, and offerings for sin, and establishes the will of God. Jesus is the will of God finished. Jesus is the will of God done. Stay with me. By that will, by what will? By what Jesus of Nazareth did, which we're going to see fleshed out in just a moment. We, that is the believer, have been sanctified. Sanctified. Hagios in Greek. It's the same word as holy. By what Jesus did, we have been sanctified, separated. That's what the word means, hagios, to be separate from, distinct from, other than. By what Jesus did, we have been sanctified. Sanctified from what? From sins. By what he did, we have been sanctified from sins. See, we don't believe that. But by that will, we have been saying that through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once. Now, the New King James says once for all. The words for all are in italic, so they're not in the original language. So literally, it just says we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once. Once. He did it once, and that once sanctified. Sanctified who? All who believe. Yeah. Yes. Acts 13, 39, and through him, Peter says, all are sanctified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Okay, stay with me. Still here? Still here? No, no, watch this. Watch this. And yet, verse 11, every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. Now once again, you got to remember, the Hebrew writer is writing after the resurrection. And so he's saying, now this has been done and there's still people over here offering bulls and goats. And... Now that was in the Jewish religion. In the Christian religion, there's still people making deals. Still people trying to convince God they'll never do it again. You don't believe it and he doesn't believe it. Well, let, let, me not, let me not say that. He believes what you say. The point is, he wants you to understand you don't have to say it. Because that is not the basis upon which he is receiving you. 
And, and the more you make those kinds of deals, the more you are reminding yourself that the work isn't finished. And that's why he doesn't want you to do it because of the effect that it has on you. Not on him. It's the effect that it has on your conscience. Wow. He said, I don't want you coming to me making deals. I don't want you coming to me making promises. I don't want you coming to me because that affects your conscience. And it is a it is a revelation of the fact that you don't realize how finished the work is. I, I got I to gotta keep going. I, could, I can stay there. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. Everybody say they can never take away sins. Look at verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down. At the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering he has perfected, he has completed forever, he has matured forever those who are being sanctified. Now, in one place it says we have been sanctified, in another place it says we are being sanctified. Now which one are we? Are we sanctified or being sanctified? We're both. We are sanctified from sins and we are being sanctified in our minds, will, emotions, and attitude to the fact that we are sanctified from sins. See, we are sanctified in actuality but until our minds are renewed to the reality that we're sanctified, though we have been sanctified, we're not living like we're sanctified. So he says, by one offering you have been sanctified. That is the legal reality. But the experiential reality is you got to renew your mind to that truth in order to walk like it. Which is why he says in the very next phrase, are you still here? Are you still here? He says, but the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. In other words, we don't have to take just the legal thing. We've got the Holy Ghost who through the scriptures has already said, watch this. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Look at verse 17. Then he adds. Everybody say, then he adds. Yeah. Say it again, then he adds. So watch this, not only am I going to put my laws in your heart and in your mind, oh God, but your sins and your lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Now why does God remember them no more? It's not even a conscious choice. It's a legal reality. They have been remitted. He can't remember them. They do not exist. It is impossible to remember something that doesn't exist. You're not listening to me. It is impossible to recall something that never happened to you. You new creation, you. Look at your neighbor and tell, tell him it is impossible to remember something that never happened to you. Remembering something that didn't happen is called a delusion. It's called a deception. It's called an hallucination. You still here? Yeah. Why? 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 Then he adds their sins and laws, these I remember no more. Why? Because where remission of these is, there is no longer an offering for sin. Notice, where remission of these is, not forgiveness of these, remission of these. And here is where 
the modern day church has fallen short of the gospel that the early church preached. We have preached the forgiveness of sins to people, not the remission of sin. The revelation of the remission of sins is beyond the revelation of the forgiveness of sins. For it is the understanding that sins are remitted that releases the worshiper from the need to make more offerings. See, the worshiper, look at your name and say, he's talking about you now. You're the worshiper. The worshiper who has a revelation of the remission of sins has no need to make an offering for sins. The worshiper who only understands that his sins are forgiven is constantly needing to make offerings. Still here? Still here? Wait a minute, Bishop. Are you saying that we're not to tell people that their sins are forgiven? No, your sins are forgiven under the old covenant. They're remitted under the new. Still here? Jesus, Luke 24, 46 and 47, on the resurrection side of an empty grave says, Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached. That repentance and remission of sin should be preached. That repentance and remission of sins not repentance and forgiveness of sins still here the word remit afimi in greek apple meaning off and hiemi to send away remission apothemi to send away your sins have been sent away Away from who? Away from you. They were, they were sent away. Away from who? Away from you. So they and you are separate. This was foreshadowed in the Old Covenant when the high priest would go and lay his hands on the scapegoat and then the scapegoat would be led out of the camp and led out in the wilderness, never again to return to the camp. The revelation being that this has carried your sins away and you can't see them anymore. You can't find them. The goat's not coming back and neither are your sins. This is what it means. This is what the Bible means when it says, surely he has borne our sicknesses. It doesn't mean he just had them on him. It means he took them away from you. He carried them away from you. They can't get back on you unless you permit them back on you because you don't know that they've been taken away from you. Come on, say amen to this. Still here? I said, are you still here? I'm almost done with the first point. I'm serious. I'm not even kidding slightly. Watch. Verse 18, now what, 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 watch what he said. See, we know this next verse, but we don't know all that leads up to it. Watch, now where remission of these is, there is no longer an offering for sin. Therefore, brethren, having boldness. In other words, if you know this, you should be bold. You should never come to God with your head down, wondering, will he hear me? Can I get in? Will I make it in? He said, no, 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 no. He said, once you know this, have boldness to enter into the holiest of all by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. 
come in boldly. Come in boldly. But Bishop, you don't know what I'm dealing with. No, you don't know what he did for you. Come in boldly. But Bishop, you don't know what happened to me last night. No, you don't know what happened for you 2,000 years ago. Come in. Watch it. Therefore, brethren, having boldness in the holiest, meaning the very presence of God, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. Here's why you can come in boldly, because you're coming in a new way. You're not coming in the other way. You're not coming in the old covenant way where you have to make a sacrifice. You're coming in the new covenant way where the sacrifice has already been made and the blood of Jesus, the Bible says, is testifying better things than that of Abel. It's talking. So when you come in, the blood is in. Here comes a new creation. Here comes a righteous one. Here comes... Here comes a sinless one. Here comes one who has believed on your name. Here... Look at your name said the blood is talking for you. I said look at your name said the blood is talking for you. No matter what you did, how you failed, what happened, you have the right to remain silent. Just go in boldly. Watch. Hey! I said, hey! Look at your neighbor and say, no more consciousness of sin, no more. Now we're going to get deeply into this. See, when you add up Oreshata, when you immerse yourself in the revelation of righteousness, when you get it, and you begin to rehearse it, and you begin to declare it, Look, look, look what the word says. Mm. He's concentrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Watch this. He, he, having a high priest over the house of God. Now remember, what is he the high priest over? He's the high priest over our confession. The Bible calls him the high priest over our confession. See, in the old covenant, the high priest took the offering from the people and went before the Father and worshipped him with it. And once the sacrifice was accepted, the high priest came back out and blessed the people with the results of the sacrifice that he had offered on their behalf. That was the high priest's job. Are y'all here? Now, the high priest in the old covenant went into the holiest of all with the blood of bulls and goats, with the sacrifices that the people brought. He was the high priest over their sacrifices. So he was the high priest over bulls, Goats, sin offerings, peace offerings, wave offerings, heave offerings. He would take them, go in, worship the Father with it, and whatever the corresponding blessing was for that offering. After he had worshipped God with it, he would come back out and then pronounce or bless the people with whatever that offering was supposed to merit them. Our high priest is not a high priest over bulls, goats, sin offerings, wave offerings. He is the high priest over our confession. Yeah. So, what is our offering? Let us offer unto him continually the sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of our lips. 
giving thanks to his name or speaking in agreement, saying thank you for whatever his name says he is. That's the only offering you and I are supposed to be offering our high priest. So what is his name? His name is Rapha. So that's my confession. And I worship him for being the Lord, my physician healer. And when I bring that offering, my high priest turns to the father and says, do you hear Clarence? He's saying he's healed. Do you hear Clarence? He's saying he's prospered. Do you hear Clarence? He's saying he's the head only and not the tail. And the father looked, he said, well, get out there and bless him with it. Get out there and make sure it comes. Get out there and make sure he gets some more of it. Look at your neighbor and say, that's what the angels do. They hearken unto the voice of the word of the Lord. So when you say you're healed and you refuse to say anything other than that and you keep making that sacrifice a place, your high priest says, okay, angels, go to work. Operate at night. I got to quit, I know. Lay your hand on your brother, lay your hand on your sister and say, God works the night shift, honey. You go to bed. Speak the word, go to bed. Let the angels go to work. God works the night shift. You can go to bed at night, wake up in the morning and the thing be settled. I don't know. Look at your name and say, be bold about it. Be bold about it. Be bold. I said, look at your name and say, be bold about it. He said, hold fast to your confession of faith without wavering. I know what the devil said. I see what the doctor said. I know what the lawyer said. But you've got a high priest over your confession. Ah, Woo, excuse me. Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. Do you see why the enemy wants you preoccupied with your sins? He wants you to waste valuable time trying to make deals, trying to feel better, trying to feel worthy. When what you're supposed to be saying is, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am healed. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm the head and not the tail. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, say something God can work with. Just tell them that. Look at your neighbor and say, stop wasting your time trying to feel better. Well, as soon as I get my conscience soothed, Baby, you speak the word, the blood will take care of your conscience. I'm prophesying to somebody. 